Good morning, church. Good morning. Welcome to Rest in Bible Church. I'm glad you all chose to get up this morning and come and uh, gather together to worship the Lord. Uh, if you are visiting with us uh, for the first time or second time, you still consider yourself new here and you haven't yet connected with us, we would love to get to know you a little bit better. And the easiest way for you to do that is just to fill out one of those connect cards that's in the seat in front of you, uh, in the seat back pocket in front of you. Fill that thing out, drop it off with one of the, the nice folks, the friendly people at our welcome uh, desk this morning. And if you are joining us online, we also welcome you. And you can do the same exact thing. There's a little button on the web page there that says new to RBC. If you click on that, it'll take you through that same process and just allow us to get to know you and connect with you. Um, if you've been here for any length of time at all, you know that the, the mission of Rest in Bible Church is to know Jesus Christ and to make him known. And that the sort of the rhythm of life, the way that we do that here is by gathering together as his people, growing in Christ's likeness as we sit under the preached word, as we study the word of God, uh, giving of ourselves, our time and our talent and our treasure, and then going out with this message of the hope of the gospel to our community. That's what we're about here. And I cannot think of a better way, when I think of giving time and talent and treasure, I can't think of a better example than our moms. And so I want to wish all of our moms a happy Mother's Day today. And thank you for giving of yourselves. Yes, you deserve a big round of applause for sure. Every year in the past, we have taken up a special offering and uh, given that offering to Mosaic Virginia, which is a crisis pregnancy center that offers uh, medical and non-medical support to moms that are facing uh, unexpected pregnancies or unplanned pregnancies. This year, we're, we're doing something a little bit different. Um, we have become a regular monthly financial partner with Mosaic Virginia in honor of our moms. And so know, moms, that um, we are honoring you here at Reston Bible Church by supporting other moms and supporting life here in our local community. So thank you. Thank you again. Yes. Amen. Another give opportunity, this one's an opportunity for all of us. Last week we saw a video from our children's ministry with a call for volunteers for our annual kids camp. So this week it's a different call. It's not the same, so we need to pay attention. This is a call for our Quest uh, summer volunteers. This is an opportunity to give our regular uh, Quest leaders and small group leaders and welcome team and all of the folks that work with our children raising a generation to know Jesus Christ and to make him known, to give them a break for the summer. And it's an opportunity for you all to get uh, some experience in children's ministry. So pay attention to this quick video from Tony Cho. Hey everyone, this is Tony Cho, Director of Children's Ministry at RBC, and I want to invite you to volunteer for Quest. Quest is the Children's Ministry of RBC focused on infants to fifth graders. So we have about 60 to 70 volunteers every week that serve year round, and we would love to give them a break during the summer. So that means we need 60 to 70 volunteers to take their place in order to keep running Quest during the summer. So that's where you come in. So I would love for you to hear from them about why they do what they do. I have been in children's ministry for about 20 something years, 20 years maybe? I don't know. It's been so long, my kids were little, which is the reason why I started getting into children's ministry. My youngest son um, is special needs. And so it's been kind of a family event. My husband's joined me and we just continue, we love it. Not only are we teaching the kids the joy of Jesus, but they give us so much back. And it's just an awesome thing where you can just see that light bulb trigger with them. You don't know when it's gonna happen, but you're able to look at them and all of a sudden they get that concept. I don't know, it's that thing that you just kind of keep on chasing with them because you know that at some point through the year they're gonna get it. I actually have two reasons why I volunteer at Quest. The first reason is I like the idea of, uh, of working in the fields you know, just planting those seeds and then watching God make them grow. And then the second reason is, is uh, I was reading my Bible one time and I was reading the passage where Jesus is saying, hey, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, you have to have faith like a child. You've got to become like a child. And so in working with these kids over the last 12 years, one thing that I've seen is true and genuine faith. Faith without cynicism, faith that is just 
the best that it ever could be. What has kept me in children's ministry for the last 12 years? Uh, my wife says I'm distracting during the service, and so she actually prefers me to be away. Now, uh, what's kept me in the ministry the last 12 years is just watching these kids come to know Christ, to love Christ, and uh, just the thought of, of, of one of those seeds uh, taking root and, and becoming a mustard plant, like the way Jesus describes in the Bible, it just really gets me excited. So it's very rewarding and I just thank God and I really do thank God that I have the opportunity to do it. I've been serving in the children's ministry for almost 20 years. Um, I grew up in a Christian home where serving was modeled to me by my parents. And as I grew in my faith, I knew I wanted to uh, follow Jesus' example and serve others. So I started out serving in the nursery when my kids were babies. And as they moved through the children's ministry, I've served as a Sunday school teacher, a WANA leader, um, kids camp leader, and I'm currently helping at the Quest Desk. When my children aged out of children's ministry, I really decided that I wanted to stay and continue serving. I found that uh, the people that I served with alongside of for over these years um, were more than friends, they were family. And as well as the kids just being adorable and fun, uh, and what a privilege to be able to guide these little hearts towards Jesus. So hopefully you're convinced to invest in the next generation, to know Christ and to make him known. So the commitment is about three months, June, July, and August. Go to restandbible.org slash kids and you can find out more information and also just click on the volunteer link and you can sign up. We will have tables in the lobby today, so stop by. Hope to see you there. All right. You're probably wondering what in the world is going on up here. Um, what a great day for some uh, parent-child dedications. Uh, when we uh, do... Uh, parent-child dedications, we are continuing on with a, a custom, a tradition that dates all the way back into the Old Testament. If we look in 1 Samuel, we see that Hannah brought Samuel to the temple to, to dedicate him. If you look in the New Testament, Mary and Joseph bring Jesus to the temple to dedicate him. Um, and so these parents today are here before their community of faith to dedicate themselves to raising their children um, to raising a generation that, that knows Jesus Christ and makes him known, and to ask you for your support as they go uh, through that process, recognizing that, that the parents are the primary disciple makers, the primary movers in that, in that mission to raise a generation that knows Christ and makes him known, but that the church as a whole, as a community, participates in that with them. So I'm going to have them introduce themselves here, um, starting on, the, on my left. Good morning. Uh, my name is Gabe Cropsey, and this is my wife, Bethany, and our sons, Judah, and then our daughter, Zoe, Tirza, and we're going to dedicate our daughter, Alexis, this morning. Good morning. My name is Trum Haskell. This is my wife, Meredith. Uh, this is our son, Mason. This is our son, Brantley, and today we are dedicating Reed Davidson. Good morning, my name is Catherine Enriquez. This is my husband, Amirkar, my daughter, Kaylee, and we're dedicating Micaela today. Hi, hi, good morning. I'm Morgan McNeil. Uh, this is my wife, Pietra McNeil, and here's Amy, and we're gonna dedicate Amy today. Good morning, I'm Jason Merrick. This is my wife, Haley Merrick, and we are, this morning we are dedicating Oakley Merrick. Good morning, my name is Dan Milos. Uh, this is my wife, Kyla, my daughter, Nora, and we're dedicating Isabel here. All right, okay, parents. See if I can turn around so I can see you all. Uh, do you commit before the Lord and his people to raise this child in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, to point your child to Christ through your example, through your words, your friendships, and your marriage with the grace that he provides? All right. Church, can I ask you all to stand as we pray for these parents as a symbol of our commitment as God's people to support them in their task? Let's pray together. Lord, give us the strength and wisdom to introduce the hearts and minds of the children of your church to you and to your love. 
They are a gift, and we accept the responsibility and joy of training them to respect and obey your word. Our prayer is that they may seek you and find you in faith through Christ. Help us to remember that we are a witness to an extension of your love to them each day. May they know for certain that we delight in having them in our midst, and we desire to leave them as a lasting legacy of honor for you. In this calling, may we not be found wanting, but rejoice in Christ Jesus at a generation that loves you with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Amen. All right. If I could, you guys can stay standing because we're, gonna, we're going to read our scripture together out of Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. If you all could bow your heads with me as we uh, pray and ask for God's blessing over our time and prepare our hearts to worship him. Heavenly Father, this morning we gather as your people called by your name to turn to you in prayer and in worship that you might move in our generation and the generation to come after us, that your name might be lifted up, Father, that you, your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father God, today we thank you for the moms in our lives and in our community. We ask for your blessing upon them and that they would know how loved and cherished they are. We pray, O oh God, for your peace and your comfort for those who have lost their moms, for those among us who struggle to become moms, for those moms whose children have strayed from you and from them. Father, fill them with the hope that only you can give in Christ. Father God, may we always be a people who honor our fathers and our mothers as an expression of our love and obedience to you so that the influence of this church for Christ in this land would grow and would go on for many, many years to come. We lift our voices to you now and sing with all the joy of our salvation, God, the joy of the redeemed, not because of anything that we did or ever could do, but because of who you are and what you have done to save sinners like us. Receive our worship now, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. still the same as the walls they still fall at the mighty sound of praise they'll say my God is still the same when did he break his promise when did his kindness fail never has never will my God is still the same when did he lose his power did his mercy change never has never will my god is still the same my god is still the same just ask the words you prayed in desperation if they're They'll say my God is still the same Ask the grave If it's strong enough to keep hope in its chains It'll say God is still the same When did he break his promise? When did his kindness fail? Never has, never will My God is still the same Did he ever stop moving? Not once has he ever let go. 
Not one city ever stopped proving our God is in control. Not one city ever stopped moving. Not once has he ever let go. Not one city ever stopped proving our God is in control. When did he break his promise? When did his kindness fail? Never had. God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, and we can cling to that. He never changes. He's the rock of ages and our mighty fortress. And as we celebrate Mother's Day today and people coming from every angle of motherhood, and as we think of the society around us and the generation that we're working to raise up, it can be so overwhelming sometimes. And that's where the grace and the mercy and the loving kindness and forbearance of Christ Jesus comes in. Because we, as we raise up this next generation, as we impact the world around us, it's not about that checklist and checking boxes and doing everything right. It's not about our religious resume, but it's about Jesus over everything. And when we surrender our children, this next generation, to God and his perfect will for them and for their lives, and the way that he's going to use us in their lives. And when we surrender our lives to his perfect will and we put him above everything, then all of the details become strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And so we're going to introduce a new song this morning called Jesus Over Everything. Maybe some of you, hopefully a lot of you, checked out the Doxologies video that came out a couple of days just to prepare your hearts for worship and to sing this together today, but we're really excited to introduce this message to you, these lyrics, and to raise our voices together and declare that Jesus is sovereign and reigning above everything.
God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant and faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you'll do just what you say. Oh, the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Declare this. Above everything, our hope and our firm foundation, Lord. So I put my faith in Jesus, my anger to the ground. Lift it up, my hope and firm foundation. He'll never let me down.
Lord Jesus, great is your faithfulness. Lord, we thank you for who you are. Lord, for the strength, for the courage, for the power of the Holy Spirit to enable us and equip us to navigate whatever it is that we cross paths with here in this world. Lord, we know that he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. Lord, we have the victory in you. And we have a hope and a promise and a future because you secured it for us on that cross. And we thank you for that. And we trust you, Lord. We bring our cares, our fears, our anxieties. Lord, we bring our guard and the walls that we put up around ourselves to you this morning. We lay them here at this altar and ask that you prepare our hearts and our minds and open our ears to hear the truth of your word and to be impacted by it deeply. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we are so glad to have you here at Reston Bible Church on this Mother's Day. Our verse for this day, as well as on Father's Day in a few weeks, uh, is found in Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, that you uh, read at the top of our time together. It says, honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land and that the Lord your God is giving you. Well, it was in 1905 when Anna Jarvis lost her mother. It was a tragic experience for her and she kind of launched out on a journey to create Mother's Day. The first Mother's Day was held in 1908 in many states around the nation, although Congress had yet to uh, submit, uh, approve a proposal for a national holiday. That wasn't until 1914 under the uh, leadership of Woodrow Wilson when it was established on the second Sunday in May. You may be interested to know that in 1920, Anna Jarvis organized a series of boycotts against Mother's Day after having helped found it because it had become so commercialized and outside of the realm of what she had hoped for that she was boycotting Mother's Day and the commercialization. Her desire was simply that people would honor mothers for the incredible role that they play in their lives with some handwritten notes and some small gifts and so forth. Now, I know together, as, as we gather together today, Mother's Day is a mixed bag, right? For many of us here today, you had a great mom and your experience growing up was powerful and it create, helped you to be created to be who you are today. For others, not so much. You struggle to find just the right greeting card that, that shares an appropriate sentiment without saying something that you really can't say. And we know that there are women among us today who are desperately desiring to be mothers and in the providence of God that has yet to take place. I can tell you that the greatest, one of the greatest challenges in our journey, my wife and I, uh, was our journey through infertility. It was during that time period, uh, just so in God's uh, plan that we were leading a young couples ministry at the time. Every Sunday evening we had about 50 young couples uh, in a room together uh, at, on a journey and you know if there's one command in the scripture that young couples take very very seriously it's to be fruitful and multiply right it's like like rabbits they are okay and so we're struggling with infertility trying to rejoice with those who are rejoicing and hoping that they would weep with us as we wept through that time period in our life Today, we are going to focus on the value of mothers, the importance of mothers. Regardless of where we are, whether you're married or single, whether you're male or female, valuing God's overarching created order is what we're talking about today. God has a created order. And many of us walk in ways that are not quite exactly in alignment with that, but we all value because it's mothering and fathering are designed by God for the good of culture. And we all benefit from a healthy culture in God's design, whether we fit perfectly into all of that in different seasons of our life or not. God's created order is found in Genesis chapter one, right back to the very beginning where it says, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves 
on the earth. From the beginning of time, God created that a man and a woman would come together and they would be part of his creative process for the next generation, for the good of all mankind. We live in the first time in human history where a distinction between biological sex and one's gender has come onto the scene. And this is a false dichotomy. This is a false narrative today. And if you are with us here or you are online and you are struggling in your own skin, experiencing where you are, we value you, we love you, we wanna walk with you. But one thing that's not happening is that you were born in the wrong body. That is not happening, whatever it might be in your journey. We were not afraid several years ago to bring Christopher Yuan, who uh, had a, was full on in the gay, gay lifestyle, in the bar scene and so forth. He gave his life to Christ. He's now a professor at Moody Bible Institute, and we had him here to talk about holy sexuality. Later on this year, we are gonna introduce you to a man by the name of Walt Heyer. Walt is a biological male. He grew up, he got married, he had several children, he then divorced. He lived for eight years after having fully transitioned in the world's description of that as a woman. He lived for a woman, as a woman for eight years. He came to faith in Jesus Christ. He then transitioned back to a man as it were. He is now married and he has lived for, I think it's 25 years in that marriage. And we're gonna introduce you to him next, uh, later on this year. We are not afraid to address the challenges with what God's word truly says about his created order. And never have we lived in a time period like today where God's created order is under attack. And we are gonna lovingly take a stand for that. Before we talk about mothering today, we need to go back to the created order and understand men and women because there are some distinctives about what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman, what it means to be a husband, what it means to be a wife before we can talk about what it means to be a mother and a father. In the scriptures, the husband, the man, is described metaphorically as the Christ figure. It says in Ephesians 5, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. The husband is to be the one who initiates and leads through self-sacrifice like Jesus did. He is the loving initiator and pursuer. A man is supposed to stand tall and be penetrating in his world just like his biology. Yes, I just said that out loud. I was like, Mabel, did he just say what I think he said? And someone online just spit their coffee back in their coffee cup. There is no greater tragedy among young adults, especially today, than passivity among men. I have young woman after young woman after young woman who repeatedly say to me, he just won't initiate. No men will pursue me. And there's reasons for that. More and more young men today live in fear. They live in anxiety. The strength of the women's movement that has said, really they've been told for, for several decades now, we don't need you, you're irrelevant. We, don't, we can live without you. We have a generation of strong women who have everything they want, but they, have, they don't have the one thing that they need, which is a man who loves them and pursues them. I've never once had a man in 30 years of ministry and counseling come up to me and say, I just wish my wife would pursue my heart. Not one time. <laughs> but the number of women who have said, I wish my husband would pursue my heart is countless because he is to be a leader who pursues and lays down his life in his world. The two sides of the coin of men's difficulty is one with passivity, but the other is lorded over leadership found in Matthew chapter 20. It says, but Jesus called them to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. 
But whoever will be great among you must be your servant, and whoever will be, your fir- the, the, be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And I believe with my whole heart, every ounce of my being, that the women's movement grew up out of a poor reflection of male leadership in some measure that has lorded over leadership throughout history, what that birthed was women who wanted to be cared for and cherished. And their way of doing it was to be strong. You can be a strong woman. I'm good with that. But what I've discovered in my journey here to preparing for this message, talking to a traditional mom, a working mom, a single mom, about what's lacking in her home because dad's not there, The themes are across the board. She may hit it out of the park and be an attack dog in the work world, but something happens differently inside the home. What about the ladies? The ladies in scripture are patterned after the Holy Spirit. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, in Genesis chapter two, verse 18, God created the man and he said, it is not good for the man to be alone. So I am going to create a helper suitable for him to walk alongside of him. Fast forward into the New Testament, John chapter 14, verse 16, where Jesus says, I'm going to leave and I'm going to send another helper to you. So what's the helper? The helper is the competent one who comes alongside the one in need. So back in Genesis, God realized that The man was awesome, but he had a gap. He had needs. And so he created the strong, helpful, capable one to come alongside of him. When uh, my wife is trying to provide what we refer to as course corrective feedback, into the journey, and I'm not being very receptive to that. And ladies, if you take no notes other than this one phrase, you need to write this down. She says, hey, I'm just trying to be your helper suitable. And that is her cue to me that she's just trying to help. She's just trying to be the competent one who comes alongside when she sees a need. Now, she may not be presenting it perfectly, and I may not be Receiving it perfectly. Because when she's doing that, there's a part of me that's like, you're not the boss of me. And she says, I'm just trying to be your helper suitable. Just like the Holy Spirit, who is the capable one who comes alongside the one in need. What happens when you add the sin nature to that? When you add the sin nature to the man's calling, he is either the lorded over leader, or he can abdicate and become a passive man. But when you, when you add this in nature to a woman's calling, we have a different problem. We have a different problem. Have you ever noticed that, that in no time in history has a man ever been referred to as a nag? Have you ever noticed that? Why is that? Holy Spirit, competent one, come alongside to help, add the sin nature. You can end up with a nag. What about Proverbs where it says, a continual dripping on a rainy day and a quarrelsome or contentious wife are alike. Sorry, ladies. It's right here in the Bible. (laughs) Why doesn't the Bible talk about the contentious man? Because that's not what happens to him when you add the sin nature to his calling. So we have callings in life. We have general movements that God has called us to. For men, it is the leader who lays down his life, the initiator. For ladies, it is the competent one who comes alongside the one in need. And what does this have to do with mothering? Well, we take elements of our calling as men and women, as husbands and wives, into the journey as parents. And today, we want to talk about the reality that mothers bring life. Mothers bring life. We're going to talk in a few weeks about what fathers do, but mothers bring life from the moment of conception. And this baby starts developing, the mother gives that child life. And about the nine months 
Mark, the, the woman starts saying, I need to get this baby out from inside of me to stop sucking the life out of me. In God's design for pregnancy and delivery and then the nursing and that whole reality is the life-giving element that begins and never ends in her journey as a mother. Now let me just say, if you do not have children today, you are still described by the things that we are gonna unpack today. And if you are struggling with infertility today, I wanna share a verse with you that was very helpful for us in our journey in understanding the ache that is within you to be a mother. It's found in Proverbs 30, verses 15 and 16. And it says this, it says, three things are never satisfied, four that never say enough. Sheol, which is the grave, the barren womb, the land never satisfied with water, and the fire that never says enough. Look at this powerful image. We have three things that are in the reality of the universe. One is the other side, the grave. There's always room for more in the grave. Do you know that 166,000 people will die today worldwide? And there's more room and there will be 166,000 tomorrow and the day after that as well. There is always more room on the other side. For the parched land, you can put bucket after bucket after bucket of water onto the parched land and it will never be enough. The parched land is insatiable. And fire, you just picture one of these fires, these wildfires out out west that are just, that suck up anything in sight. And the insatiable desire of a woman who wants to carry a baby rivals the insatiability of those three images of our universe. And it's challenging, it's hard, and we know that quite personally. Today we are gonna talk about three things. Three things that as a mother provides life and comes alongside that she does. So the phrase is, as she provides life and comes alongside, a mom's gonna do three things. The first one is this, she is going to nurture. Everybody understands that one of the primary contributions of a mother to her children is nurturing. Now, again, fathers ought to be nurturing. Do the bath time, read the books, do all the things that you should do, cuddle with your kids, all of that. One of my favorite times with our kids growing up was, will you snuggle with me? Will you snuggle me? Going to bed, just lay there, head on the chest. Yes, do that, dad. But the reality is that moms, as part of who they are, as part of this birth and delivery process, is nurturing. I remember when Natalie was born, almost 20 years ago now, we were in the hospital, and man, those first couple of days, Natalie, she just nursed like a champ. We were having a great time. All right, this is awesome. We're getting ready to go. The first night home, she just would not do it. She just would not nurse. About 3 a.m., Natalie's crying, Sharon's crying. I'm about to start crying. <clears throat> do we, who do we know that's a, you know, that, that knows how, to, who's a nurse that understands all of this? And we found one and got our help. But just watching the process of a mother and a child in the bonding process that is designed. Now, some of you are adoptive moms. And some of you are adoptive moms of older kids who are navigating through the challenges of raising a child that didn't experience that. And God bless you for your journey to nurture and care with a child who may have had a compromise in some of those early realities. In the American Psychological Association's article, The Lasting Impact of Neglect from 2014, it says this, the first time Nathan Fox, PhD, stepped into a Romanian orphanage, he was struck by the silence. The most remarkable thing about the infant room was how quiet it was. Take that in for a moment. Probably because the infants had learned that their cries were not responded to. Fox directs the Child Development Laboratory at the University of Maryland. The babies laid in cribs all day except when they were being fed, diapered, or bathed on a set schedule. They were never rocked or sung to. Many stared at their own hands, trying to derive whatever stimulation they could from the world around them. Basically, these kids were left on their own, Fox says. 
Fox, along with colleagues Charles Nelson, PhD at Harvard Medical School and Children's Hospital Boston, and Charles Zena, MD at Tulane University, have followed those children for 14 years. They described their Bucharest Early Intervention Project in a book, Romania's Abandoned Children, Deprivation, Brain Development, and the Struggle for Recovery. The list of problems stem from neglect reads like an index of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Poor impulse control, social withdrawal, problems with coping and regulating emotions, low self-esteem, pathological behaviors such as tics, tantrums, stealing, self-punishment, poor intellectual functioning, and low academic achievement, and on and on we could go. If we are just the product of a series of evolutionary accidents, why are we the most highly evolved creatures on the planet, why do we have the most needy and vulnerable young on the, in the entire world? Why is that? It's impossible. Lesser developed creatures are far more independent at birth. So as we evolved up, we became more dependent? No, this is God's design for nurture and for development and for a self-identity and connection and intimacy. We need more connection as humans, not less as the rest of the animal kingdom indicates for us. You know, when Natalie went off to college, she just finished her freshman year at Liberty. She was sick a lot this year. It was just constantly strep or something or whatever. And you know, you know what? Every time she was sick, she placed a call, and it wasn't to me. I'll tell you in a couple weeks why she called me. But anyway, that, you know, she called her mother, who nurtured her from a distance through all, paving the way. Go to the, go to the urgent care, do the, making all, the, all of that it was her mom. Because by God's design, as moms provide life and come alongside, they nurture. Number two, mother's shape. As moms provide life and come alongside, in that journey, they're shaping and molding all along the way. Ladies, even if you work outside the home, you are still overwhelmingly the primary nurturer and shaper of your children. Statistically, it's just true. Deuteronomy 6 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and you shall talk of, the, of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates." If you've been paying much attention to the challenges that we face in the public school system, and if you're a, a, a teacher who loves Jesus in the public school system, we pray for you. Because some challenging things are happening there as, as school systems across the nation usurp the parental role of parents in the lives of their children. And you have never seen a more upset human being in your life than a mama bear who shows up at a school board meeting to say, you will not do this with my children. You will not. As you look at play yard after play yard after play yard, play date after play date, it's overwhelmingly moms shaping their children as don't climb there, stop doing that, don't hit Johnny. Shaping and shaping their children along the way. Because ladies, you do the primary walking along the way with the children in your home. Number three, as she provides life and comes alongside, number one, a mother, mother's nurture. Number two, mother's shape. And number three, mothers meet basic needs. Mothers meet the needs. Proverbs 31. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets out about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, 
She holds the distaff and grabs the spindle with her fingers. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. You know, I tried to, I've tried to limit the use of illustrations relating to my children at times. I've gotten feedback, your children are always the heroes of your illustrations. And so I try to periodically throw them under the bus. But anyway, um, <laughs> to show you that my children aren't perfect. But for Mother's Day, my children are a perfect illustration. They're, they're the best uh, stuff that I got. As Natalie went to go off to college, my wife began to assess the needs to go off to college today. And she's going online and talk, you know, trolling the Liberty Parents website and this, that, and the other thing. And, you know, if, if I was sending her off to college, it would have gone something like this. It would have been like, blanket, check. Pillow, check. Toothbrush, check. School books, check. See you at Thanksgiving. <laughs> but when we set off, to take her to college, you have never seen so much crap in the back of an SUV. And I did just say that word, and I'm not apologizing. I'm like, what? Like, she needs all of that? She needs all of that. Oh, yes, she does. How much did I pay for that? She's got everything she needs. When it's time to go on vacation, where everybody's getting packed, I pack for one, she packs for three, because we have two kids. Do you have your this? Do you have your, do you have your supplements? Do you have your glasses? Don't forget your retainers, all of that. Who takes care of that? She does, because she, as a mother, is tuned in intuitively to the needs of our children, because as the mom, by God's design, she is the nurturer, the shaper, and the provider of needs as they live out their day. How many times has my wife looked at me about one or the other of our children? She said, something's not right. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, I don't know yet. Something's not right. Something's going on there. Oh, I'll take your word for it. And then two or three days later, Voila, problem. Problem going on, something's not right, a struggle that I didn't pick up on that she picked up on. Why? Because she's the mom, that's why. Ladies, you, by God's design, breathe life into your children. And in the breathing of life, you come alongside and you provide critical nurture you provide shaping, and you meet their basic needs day in and day out. And let me just tell you, it doesn't stop when they leave your house. I know many, many parents of young adult kids who are still providing that support in the journey of life. Motherhood and fatherhood, they are jobs that never end once they begin by God's design. You know, several weeks ago, I was meeting with a mature single woman a little further down the road and a young woman who was struggling. And what I watched that day was a woman who is not married, who is not a mother, exhibit these exact same qualities because in her as a woman, she was caring in a nurturing, shaping, meeting the needs sort of way of a younger woman. And the the culture, the body of Christ, this church is served in God's design as women, regardless of their personality style, regardless of whether they work inside or outside the home or both, whatever that happens to be, respond to the calling of God to pour nurture and shaping and the meeting of needs 
and to the lives of those around them. And so for today, especially, we say thank you to all of, your, all of you moms who have worked tirelessly to pour your life into your children. My mother has been a mother for 63 years. And today, she prays daily for each of her children, each of her sons or daughters-in-law, and every one of her grandchildren, every single day. She's continuing to pour out as she has her whole life for 63 years until the day the Lord takes her home. Ladies, respond to God's call as you have, and we're grateful to you. Well, there's one more element of God's design that I want to touch on before we go. We need to understand biblically God's design for many things. Today, we're talking about God's design for mothers. A few weeks, we'll talk about God's design for fathers. But in addition to all of that, you are designed by God in his overarching plan to have a relationship with him. And it's our hope that if you haven't entered into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, that today would be the day that you do that, that you would understand that you are designed to be in an intimate relationship with a living God. You are. But that sin keeps all of us, every single one of us, from that relationship. But God's remedy to that, to deal with sin, was to pay for it on the cross in Jesus Christ. And so one of the ways that you can respond to God's call as a man or a woman, as a mother or a father, is to respond first to your call to him, to be in a relationship with him. And then once you do that, you are then equipped through the power of the Holy Spirit and the community of the body of Christ and his word to respond to all the other calls in your life, all the other plans and design that God would have for you, founded on the one call to follow him as Lord and Savior. We pray that you would do that this very day. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you that you have a plan. You have a plan for many things in life. You have a plan for men and for women and for husbands and for wives and for children. You have a plan for each of us individually for how we'll spend our time and what we'll do to contribute to your kingdom. And Father, our world, never in history has our world laid an attack against one of the foundational elements of your design, which is the family, the institution of marriage. So Father, today we hold up that standard. We hold up that design. And we pray, Lord God, that you would help each of us to walk in alignment with your word for your honor and for your glory. And Father, I pray for everyone here today. I especially pray for those who are struggling in the area of mothering, whether it's a difficult relationship with their mother, whether it's a difficult relationship with a prodigal child so that mothering today is a painful thing, whether it's a desire to be a mother. God, that we would all seek to follow you in your design and ask your Holy Spirit to move powerfully in the life of each of us today. We pray in your great name, amen. Amen. Will you stand and close and worship with us as we sing this blessing over you and you sing it over us?
make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. 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 go from this place this morning, Lord, into our lives to shine brightly for you in our homes, with our families, with our friends, and all of those who we encounter. Lord, we thank you that you go with us, that you equip us, that you shine through us. Make his fame be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family your children and the children and the children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children may his presence go before you and 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth that if you are for us, nothing can stand against us, Lord. We love you. And we praise, we bless, we worship your name because it's the only name worthy of our adoration and our praise and our worship. Lord, may we represent you well this week. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you so much for being here with us. Happy Mother's Day. We love you guys. If you need prayer or you want to have a conversation or meet with somebody, please come forward and talk to us. Otherwise, go in the light and the love of Jesus, and we'll see you again next week. Take good care.